Yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, it's nice to meet you um, today. Today, as a brief agenda, we will talk about uh, GraphQL with Thomas. And uh, before that, do we have any vegan in the audience? Oh, perfect. Uh, by hand, do we have any gluten intolerant? Perfect. And anyone who doesn't want pizza? Perfect. Uh, now a little bit about Neo4j. And Neo4j is a graph database company. And uh, what is a graph database? Basically, we try to extract meanings, meaning from data that are deeply relational. And um, we do this well. That's why we are a company working solely on this. And um, yeah, we are engineering focused. And we have more than 800 employees right now. And uh, why it's good to join Neo4j? What are the perks um, of this company? First of all, flexible uh, remote working um, culture. Uh, many teams and many projects uh, you can work on. Uh, we have, uh, for the suite, we have dedicated FICA time. And uh, we have offices UK, Sweden, Germany, and uh, many more countries. And we are also dog friendly. And um, that's about Neo4j. And now Thomas uh, will take the lead. Thanks, Costa. Good to hear. Yeah, I'm just going to take the cable here. So we can get started. Um, this is going to take a second. So I'm going to talk about GraphQL today, um, but not only GraphQL. Actually, one of the coolest parts of GraphQL, which is real-time data updates. Um, and it's taking longer than I thought, so I, I guess I have to improvise a little bit more. So perfect. Um, let's hop right into the slideshow. It should be a little bit interactive so the audience can already take their smartphones out um, and also on the stream you can do that as well um, so i'm thomas wies as as uh, costa already said um, i'm in the graphql team no surprise um, at neo4j um, and when we built the graphql subscriptions so real-time data updates from your neo4j database we thought we need something really nice to showcase this, right? And we stumbled upon something that you may have seen before. This is uh, our place. Um, it was first on Reddit in, I think, 2017. And what it allows users is on a UI to select the color and then set one pixel, just one single pixel, and then, <coughs> sorry, and then you can set your pixel, you have to wait for 10 minutes, and then you can set another one. And with a lot of people doing that, we get this really, really beautiful art. And as you can see, it's, I don't know, there's so much in here, you can probably spend an entire evening looking at it. And we thought, what better, why not use this as a, as a base for showing off real-time data usage? And that's exactly what we did. And this is where you can use your smartphone and yeah, look at the QR code or take a picture of the, not a picture, just use a camera for the QR code or just use that uh, bit.ly link down here, um, which is neoplace minus foo minus cafe. Um, and you can actually interact with it yourself while I talk and at some point I will get your attention back again. But the idea is that you already at this point see what can this do? And then we will um, take a step back and actually look behind the scenes. So from the audience, did you, did you see it? Can you try it? Does it work? Is it, since it's a demo application, it's not guaranteed to work. But um, it's pretty, a pretty cool effort from our team. Um, so now that you actually see the potential um, of real-time data updates, we can take a step back and we can have a look at it. Um, so given this is a GraphQL talk, we probably want our client side to be GraphQL, right? But we need more elements to build this, this entire software that you look at, right? You look at the UI, we use a, a GraphQL client to build this or to, uh, to be the query side for the, for the UI. But then we have additional pieces that are missing um, in this entire stack. And we will 
discover them step by step. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is give a brief overview of a graph curl. So maybe a quick show of hands who has uh, heard or seen of graph curl. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to keep it at moderate speed, uh, we just, just so we're all on the same page. Um, so what's GraphQL? GraphQL is both a query language and a runtime in one. And it uses a type system th that describes your data in the end. And if we look at the example here, we can see on the left-hand side, we define or describe one single type, which is called project. And it has a name as a string, a tagline, which is also a string, and a contributors um, is an array of users. And we can describe the data like that. And that's actually one of the main benefits, I would say, from GraphQL, that we have this type system that lets us very clearly define our API. Um, and then, of course, we need to access this data somehow. And for that, we use GraphQL operations. And there are three of them, queries, so read, mutations, which means updating, um, deleting, or creating data. And then the topic of today, subscriptions, where we first look at the basics before we get into subscriptions. So as the next step, what I can do with GraphQL, I can um, define exactly what I want uh, for my queries. So in this example here, um, I, can, I, will, I only want to get the project that has the name GraphQL, and from that project, I only want the tagline. I'm not interested in the name or the contributors. Um, and then, as the next step, once you fire that query, uh, read query, uh, in this case, you get only that as a response, and not you don't get the name, um, just what you ask for. Uh, and that's kind of one of the superpowers, in a sense, of GraphQL. Um, but what's powering GraphQL in the background as well are something that's called resolvers. So, I mean, how does GraphQL or the GraphQL server know where this data comes from? And for that, we have to usually write our resolvers. Um, and here is a, a very simplistic example where we have um, a query, and it's, um, it resolves for the project a function, and just arbitrary here, we're finding that project. But the meaning is we have to write how we actually get, for instance, the project name from the database. Um, but more on that later, actually. So, with that as a building block, I just want to highlight a couple of benefits. Uh, one of them, we, we saw that before, like the overfetching and underfetching. So I'm just send or exactly what I requ uh, request, that I will get back. And I do it in a single request, not in seven requests. Um, GraphQL has actually a very neat specification where also subscriptions, our topic of today, is described. And um, it's very simple. It helps for developer productivity. But it has a drawback. And probably one of, one of the most talked about or most famous one is the n plus 1 problem, which means if we go back here and look, keeping our resolvers in mind, it could be for this project that the name is in one database and the tagline is in another database. Not, it's, yeah, not in this particular case, but think about it. And then if I ask for a project with a tagline and a name, I will have to first resolve the name, and then also resolve the tagline. That's two requests. And the initial one, this one, is free. Um, and that's obviously getting a problem at some point. But again, more on that later. So now we know all about GraphQL, or enough to get started. Then the next thing that we look at will be over here. And by the shape of this, it's probably a database. And given this logo here, you probably guessed it's Neo4j. And I don't even want to open up the massive topic of Neo4j. So the only thing we want to know at this particular point is Neo4j is a graph database, so we're handling graphs. And graphs are or consist of two main elements, nodes and relationships. Um, and the most important thing for this talk right now essentially is both of them are first-class citizens, so they're equally important. And also, both of them can um, hold or contain data. So both nodes and relationships can contain data. Um, that's cool, right, Thomas? You have a graph database. 
how the heck do you get the data out of there? You need a query language, right? And of course, I didn't implement that myself, but Neo4j has that. And the query language is called Cypher. And if you look at that without having seen Cypher before in your life, you probably think, well, this somehow reminds me of SQL or SQL. And you're right. Um, it borrows a lot of concepts from SQL, but since we deal with graphs, we have to extend all of that. And one of these examples of these extensions you can see is the match pattern up here, where we can describe with these characters, or also ASCII art-ish types, we can describe a relationship from, for instance, in this case here, from a person to a movie with a relationship acted in. Um, and we describe it with these characters. So it's very human readable and very easy to learn. Um, but of course, we, have, we need the full power to, to, um, to talk to a database. And for that, we have what is also uh, available in SQL, like where, filtering clauses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that hopefully gives us enough context to move on to the remaining piece to make our stack from before working. Um, so we have a database, right? We can store it there, perfect. We have our GraphQL clients with subscriptions in the end, so we can interact, we can use the UI. But how do we make these two talk with each other, right? Because here we have GraphQL and here we have Cypher. What's, let's resolve this one last thing. And for that, we just build a meme, right? You don't need more than that. Just plug the meme in there and you're good to go. No, of course not. Um, we actually built a library for that. Um, and we started that around two years ago. And it's a TypeScript library. And it fulfills exactly this purpose I talked about. It's this in-between or this middleman between GraphQL and your Neo4j database. Um, it's open source, so you can access it anytime you want. Um, <coughs> just Google Neo4j and GraphQL, and you will, you will end up there. We have pretty good documentation and all of that, but more advertisements later on, I guess. And the function of the library on the highest possible level is um, if the client sends a GraphQL query to the library, it will translate it on the fly to a Cypher query, will execute that against the database, and the result will be packed in a way that we can more or less directly send it through back to the GraphQL client. That's on the highest possible level what the GraphQL library um, is doing. And with that, um, we can move on to yeah, something which is probably the most powerful of this library. Um, so in a normal uh, GraphQL use case where you don't use the Neo4j GraphQL library, you have to start with something like this. I mean, you always have to start with this particular piece, which is the type definitions. And we keep it very simple here. So imagine our database only contains a movie and it has titles, not more than that. But then, if you're not using the Neo4j GraphQL library, you will have to write um, your read queries, like this here on top, where we read the movies, but also all your mutations. So if you want to add, change, remove, anything you want to do with your movies, you have to um, add that in, um, you have to write that yourself. And also the resolvers we talked about before, you have to handle all of that. You have to write all of that yourself. But nope, we're not going to do that here because our library generates this, the, generates this automatically for you. So the only thing that you will actually need is the very first piece. You just have to describe your data. You just need to describe what you actually have in your database. And here, it's the first time that we can actually have a closer look at uh, behind the scenes because I want to show you a little bit of code. Um, so given the type definitions from before, I want to show you how easy it is to set this up. Um, this is TypeScript or in this particular case, it's JavaScript code, um, just to make life a little bit easier. Um, and I'm just going to walk you very quickly through this. Um, so we have to get access to our Neo4j database. Um, believe it or not, this is not real. But um, I mean, the text is real, but it's not password as a password. Um, so the first thing we have to do, we have to get those type definitions. That's just getting a file where it's stored. Then 
we have to create a Neo4j driver, a JavaScript driver. We provide it with the information from before. And then we take this driver and we pass it to the Neo4j GraphQL class. You can see that here, in, together with the type definitions. And from that point onward, we just have to get the schema here. And once we, and in this uh, get schema, we do all the magic for, uh, you saw before. Like we generate resolvers for you, so you don't have to write the resolvers. And we will add a lot more things to it, which I show in a second. And then when you have generated that schema, uh, which is fairly quick, especially for such a small uh, type definitions, we pass it to a server and we just start that server. That's it, right? It's just 36 lines of code. It's almost nothing. And when I start that, I did that in the background so we can save us a little bit of time. Um, I can open up this uh, sandbox or the Apollo Studio from uh, the Apollo company and we can inspect this our GraphQL API in a very easy manner. And then we can close the circle again, right? We have these root types here. We have, in this case, only two, query and mutation. Um, query is reading the data, right? So I can read this. I can click my way through here, so I don't even need to know what GraphQL is. I just need to click. I can send this off and, oh, look at that. We have our data here, all in a readable form. Um, and I can do exactly the same with, with mutations. And here you see the full power of this, of the library. You see, I didn't write anything, but I can, with this, just click my way through and create the movie, for instance. I can delete the movie. Um, I have filtering arguments here, a lot of them actually. So um, in this case, I want to delete the movie where the title is whatever, or the title is, is in an array. So I get all of that out of the box for free, in a way, all for you, uh, ready to consume. And I have filtering possibilities also for my read queries. I can do aggregations, uh, connections. We could fill probably like two talks to go through all of that. But we have something much cooler uh, coming up. So um, let's go back to the slide deck and have a look at what's happening behind the scenes. Um, so now that we have a general idea of what the library is doing, what does it actually do in the background? And the idea is um, that from my uh, Neo4j database, I want to get a subgraph. I want to get a part of this graph. And we have this movie uh, data set at Neo4j that we quite often use for demos, which includes a range of movies. And from that, I just want to get all the movies that are released in 1999. And we do that so I can show you how a GraphQL query looks like. So the result will be a subgraph, which is here. But of course, we have to speak GraphQL to get that subgraph out of there. So how would the GraphQL query look like? And you can see that here. Um, we have it here on the top row, we have movies where the released year is 1999 or anything you wish, of course. And then, as a result, we will get the title back and all, or we want to get the title and we want to get the actor's name. See, I don't want the movie tagline, I just want the title. And now, what does that translate to um, in the GraphQL library? When I execute that against, against the GraphQL library, or if I write this GraphQL query, we will get this here. We will get the Cypher query. And no worries, you don't have to understand any uh, all of the details. Um, we just match any uh, all of the movies, make sure we only get the ones from 1999. And then in this call subquery here, in this block, we do the relationship traversal in some way. Um, and then we pack it all up in a way that the client can understand it. So we return the name here. Um, we just leave out the details because they're not of importance at this moment. And the most important thing is here, for this query, for this one single GraphQL query, I only have to do one um, Cypher query. So there's no n plus one problem. Nothing like that. One query equals exactly one Cypher query. So we're extremely fast with this. Um, so the n plus one problem for us, or if you use the Neo4j GraphQL library, it doesn't exist. Uh, and you didn't have to do anything in a way. Just query, get going. So 
Um, with that, uh, we have enough background to do or to talk about the real cool stuff, which is subscriptions or GraphQL subscriptions. Um, and the first thing we probably want to do is define GraphQL subscriptions. So GraphQL subscriptions, as I said earlier, are part of the GraphQL specifications, but they're not in too great detail. So we have a bit of freedom to implement it, or essentially the server side has a bit of freedom to implement this. But anyway, um, uh, GraphQL subscriptions involves two main elements. It has a client here um, on the left-hand side, and it has a server, and the client places a subscription on the server side, um, which then opens up a permanent connection between the two of them, which then allows the server to push through events at any given time. Um, and with that, we have kind of the basic setup for a subscription or more or less any subscription model. Um, and then the important thing to note here is it's not specified how this is actually, like which protocol in the background is used. But it turns out that usually um, WebSockets is used to do this asynchronous communication. And that's also what we used for the Neo4j GraphQL library subscription implementation. Um, so that's cool. That's, that's the highest possible level. Let's go one level deeper and let's have a look at um, how this is actually done with a bit more detail. Um, described to our use case. So if you look at this, we have um, the Neo4j GraphQL library instance in the center, being the, the piece that glues together the Neo4j database and the client. So if, um, if we look at the right-hand side client, we see that it placed the subscription at the Neo4j GraphQL um, instance, which means it's listening for changes or for mutations. Um, if then another client makes a mutation, think of creating a movie. What the Neo4j GraphQL library will do is first, and that's important, it will do what it always does with a mutation. It will execute it against the database with a Cypher query. And then only when we come back from that query or when we executed it, we will notify the subscribed client over here that changes happen. Why do we do that? Well, we need to keep the database consistent, right? We, we can't mess with that. So first things first. We first make the data change, then we inform people about that, or people, subscribers, about that data change. And one thing that probably some people will, will ask at some point is, yeah, well, what if I connect to this Neo4j database down here with any other means and make a change here? Will this one also get notified about it? Not yet, but we work on it. This is uh, ongoing work. So by today, it's only changes made through the Neo4j GraphQL instance that this client up here will be notified about it. But again, um, if you stay tuned a little bit longer, we will have this uh, working for you. Um, so with that, we can actually have a look again on the query side of things. But if you're interested, I would like to show you how little code extra we actually need to get this working. So if we dive into the code again, um, we still have this information, right? And now, uh, since this is a additional functionality, um, we, can't, uh, we have to introduce a little bit more code. Um, so to keep things simple, um, we implemented a single instance plugin because we use a plugin system to make subscriptions work. So you can you can just easily plug it in. Uh, you can get started, as you saw before, with very little code, but we have it extendable with plugins, and subscription is one of these plugins. There's more, but not a topic for today. Um, so we take, the, for the demo purpose, a single instance plugin, which means we just keep everything local on this computer. Um, but don't worry, it works outside of my computer as well, but it's just much easier to demo. Um, we do the same thing as before. We get our type definitions. We get our driver. Uh, and this time, additionally, here, we pass in that, that plugin from before, that single instance plugin. And then, since this uh, involves a WebSockets, and a WebSocket, we have to have a WebSocket server, so we have to do a little bit more uh, setup side. But we have a bunch of different examples for that. So we 
probably have covered 90% of the cases here. Um, but to keep it brief, um, we have to get an Express app. Uh, we have to get a, a WebSocket server. Um, we have to link them together with our Neo4j schema from before. And then we just pass that to the, to the server, um, the same one we looked at before from Apollo. And we start it all up. Um, it's a little bit more verbose, um, but again, it's not rocket science whatsoever. Um, it's still in less than a than a hundred lines of codes that we can uh, set this up, and the result we can look at again in the Apollo Studio because it's a neat way to demo this. And the first thing you probably notice if you look here, now we have a different or an additional root type that we didn't have before, and this one is. Uh, subscriptions, right? Um, and I can show you that. So the subscription um, query or GraphQL subscription query looks a little bit different to, to what we're used to from just before. Um, so we can subscribe in this example here, yeah, you should be able to read that, um, to movies created. And then we get, uh, we want to get back the event just so we can inspect it here. Uh, we can get the timestamp of when that event was fired. And then here, this is with the back to the power of GraphQL, from that created movie that we, the events we subscribe to, what do we actually want to get? And now, before we only had the title, so I can just remove that without any problems. So what I want now, from any subscription event I get back on the client side, so looking at here, I only want to get the title of the created movie. Then I can fire this off. And we see here our status screen, it's listening. Perfect. Um, and what do we have to do? Right, we have to create a movie so we can see what's happening. Um, I had to test this, of course, so I already created another movie. So please ignore that. Um, but we can create the movie like this um, in GraphQL. Let's move this a little bit, maybe. Format, okay, doesn't change much, sorry. So we can create the movie and we have to give it an input. So I decided to call the title Story of Toys and it was released in 1996. And again, I want to only get back the title. So I create it. As you can see here, that's the normal um, GraphQL mutation from before. But additionally, I also got the subscription back, right? With exactly what we defined over here previously. So if we look at that again, I have an event because it was a create event. I have a timestamp. And then I only wanted to get that title. So that's pretty much it. Um, and of course, one event is not super funny. So let's create another Toy Story. This time in 1998, we fire it off. And you see that? There we go. We already have another subscriptions with a create event and the, the correct title from before. And of course, we can extend that if we want. And we will get them not in guaranteed order, but with such a long distance between the events, um, we definitely get it in the correct order. And the thing is, you don't have to pull for this data. The client just waits right, and gets notified about it. Um, there's no need for busy polling or anything else that is uh, extremely resource consumption, um, uses a big e resource consumption. But we can actually do more things than just create movies. We can also do listen to created relationships, because remember, Neo4j relationships are first-class citizens. And for that, we have uh, subscriptions as well. Um, and they're a little bit we can ask for even more information. So if I want to listen to a relationship for movies that have been created, um, I can again specify which event I want, the event type. Uh, it will be create in this case, but anyway, I can ask for it. The relationship field name, which will be acted in. But then I can also ask for the movie, which one was created, that created movie, what title does it have? And then the created relationship, I can also ask for the outcome of that. So from the actor, I want to know the name and which roles it has. Um, so 
Let's just close this here because we want a different one. Cool, it's running. And now, of course, we have to create um, a movie and an actor and a relationship between them. And we do this like that in GraphQL. So we define the, the movie called Gump Forest from 1999, um, including in one single GraphQL query, um, the actors where we create the, the actor with the name Kevin Bacon, and it has the role runner, or he has the role as a runner. Um, and if we fire this off, we see again the GraphQL query, um, the response for the mutation, but then also the subscription, what we had from here before. So again, if you look at that, we have an exact match. Only what I ask for, I get back. So I have connect event um, on the relationship field name actors, the title was Gump Forest, uh, and so on. We have Kevin Bacon here in his role as a runner. Um, and again, if, if, I, if I were to introduce another Kevin Bacon, we get this here, and I don't have to do any busy polling or anything. Um, so that's subscriptions in a nutshell, I guess. And you saw this, where I have to quickly reload. This is powered by GraphQL subscriptions. Um, of course, this is just a demo purpose, but um, people are already, or customers and users are already using this for real in business applications. Um, and you can see this also creates some sort of art. <laughs> um, so if we go back to our slideshow, the last thing we want to do is again look behind the scenes because there are some interesting things that we're doing um, to make subscriptions work. Um, so, but first we have to um, see behind what, how does it look like on a query level if we didn't turn on subscriptions? So before the time of subscriptions in a way. So if we have this create movie query from before where we have the movie this time called Hot Fuzz, um, we have a query that looks like this. Um, where we create the movie, we set its title, and then again we return it in a way that the client can easily read it. So now, and this is actually very interesting, when we toggle on subscriptions, so we provided the plugin, what the library does is this here. The, the mutation on the left hand side that the client fired off, it didn't change at all, and that's exactly what we want, because the client shouldn't be concerned about how to create its movie. Does it need subscriptions on or not? No, that's not of concern. But what the library needs to do is inject this additional data here called meta with the information that we could consume before in the Apollo Studio, for instance, where we define, oh, this is going to be a create event. Oh, sorry. This is going to be a create event. It has the type name of a movie. We have the timestamp here and some additional information. And down here at the bottom, you see we also return this. And that's exactly, to, um, we can tie it back again. So once this has executed um, against the database, the Neo4j GraphQL library will see, oh, this particular mutation contains metadata. So do I have subscribers for this create movie event? Yes, no? Oh, yes, cool. Then let's, let's send this uh, subscription event to those subscribers. And this means we have full database consistency and we can inform as many subscribers as we want without um, affecting the database or the database performance, I should say. Um, and probably the last thing is, if you think about what we saw before with this large canvas of our place from Reddit, it probably had thousands of people working on that at the same time and maybe Setting a pixel is not very resource consumption, but if we think of bigger use cases, we will end up with a problem like this because we will have use cases where um, our Neo4j GraphQL library cannot handle all the traffic anymore. So we have to horizontally scale it. And when we scale it, because we're so lucky, our use case really thumped up, we're, we're, going, we're going good. Um, but then we can end up with this situation, right? That a client over here subscribes to this particular Neo4j GraphQL instance, 
Um, but the mutation happens on this instance. So how do we make sure this guy over here or this person or client gets informed um, about the mutation occurred over here? Isn't there something missing here, right? And we've solved that already. Um, so what we do in this case um, is we add an additional message broker here um, in between, which um, after the mutation happened, we do the cipher query as before, nothing changes. And then we also send an additional event to this broker. And the broker then in itself um, sends broadcast information to all the Neo4j GraphQL library instances, which then in turn send out subscription events to any of the subscribers, which means we can scale this extremely well. So we can scale both Neo4j, but also your Neo4j GraphQL library, including subscriptions. We can just scale it all to a massive extent. Um, but then you probably think, well, this is going to be a pain to set up. So much more code to write. And actually, no, it's very simple. We already created a plugin for that, which is called Neo4j GraphQL Subscriptions AMQP. And the only thing you have to do there is provide connections detail, connection details to that broker, which can be uh, a RabbitMQ broker, it can be Kafka and many others. And you only have to provide the connection in a way that actually suits you well. And then given this is a plugin system, I just push the plugin in here and then we're good to go. That's all you have to do. Okay, yeah, you also have to set up the broker, but there's many means to do that also on cloud. With a couple of clicks, this works. So on your Graf Neo4j GraphQL instance server side, you don't have to do much, and it will just scale. And that's actually also what we used to power this in the background. We made sure this can actually scale if it really has to scale. Maybe this use case doesn't have to scale that much. But we do use all the things I just outlined. We have a broker. Um, we obviously have a Neo4j database. We use uh, Neo4j, the Neo4j GraphQL library, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, I'm actually at the end. Um, yeah, I think time-wise, I'm pretty much there. So thanks a lot for being here. Um, again, the library that is pretty much yeah, powering this entire talk it's open source uh, under Neo4j slash GraphQL. Uh, just Google Neo4j and GraphQL and you will find it. Um, you will also reach us on Discord. Um, we're quite active there, actually. So just, again, Discord Neo4j, you will find the Discord server. And there we have our own channel, which is called GraphQL, believe it or not. Um, and I think I added some helpful links, um, just in case, um, especially in the stream can probably pause it at some point if you need that. We have documentation, um, yeah, again, GitHub. We have some more additional tools that, yeah, that I'm not going to touch upon right now. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Uh, that's the end. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> questions, yeah. I'm ready for questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, can you have a, subscri a subscription that is kind of triggered when you change a property, for example? Yeah. Of an old? Yeah, we can also do that. Right? See. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you change a movie title, right, we, we can, we have a subscription for that as well. And as you saw, also the relationship uh, between the movie and an actor. So we can can do a lot, right? Also, for, also for the scaling, um, if you have different server instances with a different code base, do they sync the subscription configuration on the broker, or is it per instance? No, it's per instance. Because it is per instance. Yeah. The broker, we just make sure that we can actually broadcast out these events to all the different Neo4j, 
GraphQL instances. Um, is there any plan for Neo4j to support instances, uh, subscriptions natively instead of having something on the outside handling it? So for example, we can see Postgres or other databases having subscriptions. You mean Generally, something like the change data capture? Um, I mean, we enable it through GraphQL, right? Mm -hmm. Subscriptions through GraphQL. But if you talk about Neo4j, the database, and mm -hmm. then going to, through the database, I mean, that's kind of not our uh, part anymore, right? But yeah, we work on, I mean, we as in Neo4j work on a, a new technology or functionality. Um, but I'm, I can't say how much we actually expose of that to the public. Or something. Cool. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, Thomas. And see you around. <laughs>